Well, welcome everyone. Um, I am just uh, uh, wanted to share a few of the ground rules for our discussion and, and then in just a minute, I'll turn it over to Mary Devins, um, who uh, has been gracious enough to invite Chris Newell uh, to be our speaker today. So it's, a, it's an honor to, to be with all of you, uh, in, in particular, Chris, to have you with us. Um, as we all know, we are marking uh, Indigenous Peoples Weekend. Um, and in so doing, we, we wanted to honor and um, state that we are grateful for the Indigenous ancestors upon whose land we dwell. Uh, here in, in Old Lyme Old and Lyme, yeah. Connecticut. Um, and we honor the Nahantic, the Pequots, and the Mashantic tribes in particular, who all lived here um, and walked in beauty before us. Uh, so we thank them um, and remember them in particular uh, uh, right now. As well, uh, Chris, in a, in a few min minutes, is going to uh, share his presentation. And then when we get to the part of the Q&A, um, I will uh, unmute anyone who uh, raises their hand and wishes to ask a question. And we can get a conversation going. How does that sound? OK, great. And uh, Mary Devins. OK. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, this would be my first virtual adult forum. <laughs> but here we are in the time of, of Zoom, right? So I, I'd love to uh, welcome Chris. We're really f fortunate to have Chris join us, especially on the eve, as, as has already been said, of um, Indigenous Peoples Day, which was formerly known as Columbus Day. So if we're following all the the changes that we're trying to make uh, with social justice in the country. It's very nice that it's been renamed, um, you know, Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, so I first met Chris, um, I was a staff advisor to a, a class at Connecticut College, and we took a, a tour of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum, and Chris was our, our leader. And I have to say, it was stunning. I mean, it was just over the top and he was a wonderful guide. And, you know, I've been to the museum before, but just sort of ran through. But having Chris there as our guide, he made everything about it come alive. So if you all, I know Chris is no longer at the museum, but if once it opens again, as soon as it opens again, I would encourage any of you to go bring your children or grandchildren and have a guide. The fact that we had Chris as a guide just, just totally opened the whole thing up. Um, so I'm going to make a, apologies ahead of time if I mispronounce some, some, of the, some of the beautiful Indian words in your bio. And I know they're going to be serious and egregious. So please um, jump in and correct me, Chris, as, as I make those mispronunciations. All right, so let me go ahead and read Chris's bio to you all. Chris Newell Passamaquoddy is Executive Director and Senior Partner to Wabanaki Nations for the Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor, Maine. He was born and raised, and here's the word I cannot pronounce, Chris Mota, can you tell, help me out on that? Madak Miguk. There you go, thank you. <laughs> in parentheses, Indian Township, uh, Maine. He is a proud citizen of the Passamaquoddy tribe at Indian Township. Chris's education career began immediately after high school as a substitute teacher during his time as an undergraduate at Dartmouth College. He's a longtime member of the Mystic River Singers, an internationally acclaimed and award-winning intertribal powwow drum group based out of Connecticut. For over two decades, Chris devoted much of his time to Mystic River, traveling all over the United States and Canada, singing at community powwows and spending time in those communities learning various native musics. Chris earned an interdisciplinary Bachelor of General Studies from the University of Connecticut, which propelled him back into educating as a profession. He served for six years as the education supervisor for the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center, where his team has led the group experience for over 50,000 guests. Out of the museum, Chris and his museum colleagues co-founded the Akomwat. How did I do on that? Almost. Agamout. Okay. <laughs> Educational initiative as a response to observations of the public school system and the lack of representation of native history and social studies. Chris combines his music and education disciplines together and often makes presentations that educate but also entertain. 
Along with his work in education, Chris has also appeared in feature films and was the senior advisor on the documentary Dawnland, chronicling the historic first ever government sanctioned Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the state of Maine. And in 2019 was honored by the New England Museum Association with an excellent award. His dedication to his work goes back to his experiences at Dartmouth. He is a second generation native educator looking to change our world for the better. Welcome, Chris. All right, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, good to see you all, everybody. Um, so uh, you've, you've heard all the intro. Uh, I do currently work uh, ever since March as the executive director and senior partner to Wabanaki Nations for the Abbey Museum. And I'm gonna be talking uh, about that work uh, as we go forward. And uh, the subject of my presentation today is really kind of my perspective as, an, as a Passamaquoddy educator uh, on education. Um, um, you know, somewhere, sometimes uh, where the limits are, but also what can we do uh, at collectively as people, uh, you know, in this country to uh, update the way we talk about Native content. Uh, and there's a big reason why, um, you know, I, I grew up going to to uh, the reservation school, all, you know, in Indian Township, uh, all the way to eighth grade. And uh, then I went to high school off reservation. And it wasn't until I started to go off reservation that I started to realize that people looked at us as something different. Um, and I didn't really understand why. And, and, and during my public school career, uh, that portion of my life, um, I started to uncover exactly why. Uh, and I was in introduced to books like Bury My Heart or Wounded Knee by Dee Brown, which told American history from a very much uh, different side than the U.S. history class uh, that I was taking when when I was in high school. Uh, I was an all A student, you know, uh, you know, through my high school career, and until I took uh, U.S. history in my junior year, um, and by the midterm I had a C minus in the class, and it wasn't because I couldn't absorb the material or do the work. It's because I had tremendous problems with the content. Um, the history of the United States was being retold to me as a Passamaquoddy citizen, knowing my Passamaquoddy history and how we helped uh, in the American Revolution and other things um, and uh, was all of that was completely just not there it was it was totally erased um, the way native content is typically taught in the public school system uh, is in just kind of three touch points one is European exploration uh, which is largely mythologized uh, then we talk about um, the uh, the Mayflower landing in 1620 uh, and that kind of you know jumps over a whole lot of of history to get to that point in history and, and is once again mythologized uh, as kind of a foundational myth of this country. And then we don't talk about Native people again until we talk about 19th century westward expansion. Um, which covers over all of the colonial history and the engagement with Native communities, uh, the creation of reservations in Connecticut, which is the home base of reservations. Reservations began in Connecticut first. And I am coming to you actually from Mashantucket, Connecticut, which is the oldest continuously occupied reservation in the country, established in 1666. Um, you know, so. Um, there's a whole jumping over uh, of all of that colonial history, uh, you know, uh, uh, w w uh, sorry, all of that history with just colonial history and uh, none of uh, the contributions of Native peoples were uh, included. And uh, when it comes to the history of the United States um, during the Industrial Revolution, uh, Native people were there. During the American Revolution, Native people were there. In fact, the sovereignty of America, uh, the Amer early Americans, was first recognized by Wabanaki chiefs. Uh, in the Treaty of Watertown. So Americans owe their sovereignty to recognition by native peoples first and then by other European countries later after the American Revolution. So um, that's all a part of history that uh, I grew up knowing but was not being taught. And I had such a problem with it that I was just doing horribly in the class because I was so frustrated. Uh, eventually my parents stepped in of course uh, and uh, I did finish uh, well in the class, but uh, you know, I kind of did it. Um, uh, you know, uh, under pressure, uh, you could say. Um, 
so I, I got to Dartmouth College, uh, and uh, that's really where I really started to understand how, you know, uh, it was a, a much more diverse community. Uh, but the, the Ivy League demographic in the 90s, you know, is uh, not the demographic that I came from, uh, the typical the Ivy League demographic, I should say. Uh, and um, what I was realizing uh, is, that, you know, Dartmouth had, you know, the Dartmouth Indian mascot up until the 1970s when uh, they, it was never the official mascot, but the, 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 the sports team used it as such up until the 70s when the college uh, finally put a stop to it and took over the name the big green um, but uh, during the 90s there was an element on campus that, that preserved uh, the Dartmouth Indian imagery and uh, would hand out free t-shirts for the incoming freshman during orientation week and things of that sort to keep uh, that, that imagery alive and so it was not uncommon you know you go to the sports games and you would see people you know practicing the old chants that they did from the 70s uh, uh, and things of that sort. And uh, that was where I realized at my first, you know, prof you know oh, well, it's not professional, first Division One football game that I'd ever been to in my life was a home game at Dartmouth College that people still enacted the stereotypes that they saw from the sports mascots when, within the sports uh, context um, and saw no problem with their behavior. And uh, I sat there kind of um, uh, had a moment of realization that these folks, I, I'm at an Ivy League institution and these folks are likely going to be uh, become CEOs, um, representatives, senators, you know, all of those things. And that's what that's what's happened. Uh, many of those people that I, I knew back then have become those positions. And what I was looking around and saying, this is all they know about me, is this generalized idea of what a native person is, where I'm not a native, I'm a Passamaquoddy. Uh, there's over a thousand different cultures in, the, in North America that identify as native. Uh, and all of us are culturally different from one another. Um, so I don't identify as native, I identify as Passamaquoddy. And those little subtleties are not being taught to the American public. And this, uh, and uh, the, you know, the pop culture, uh, the sports mascots, this is what they were uh, accustomed to. And because of, uh, you know, my mom is non-native, uh, I am very light-skinned, uh, I have blue eyes uh, to many of the Dartmouth students. I didn't appear as authentically native uh, because of the implicit biases that they were brought up with. Um, so my, I had to constantly justify my existence as a Passamaquoddy even though I was born and raised in a home where two languages were spoken uh, in my home community and I have a whole community of people that takes me and accepts me as accept, accepts me as a Passamaquoddy uh, which is why I self-identify as such so um, that's why I got into a lot of this work and I just wanted to preclude my talk uh, with where I'm coming from uh, when it comes to that. So I'm going to do, we're going to uh, experiment, hopefully the screen sharing is working for me here and I'll get into my PowerPoint. Just a second. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you know, uh, possible quality perspective on education. Uh, so I kind of got into it a little bit already, you know, the, the touch points that I was talking about that the public school system typically has you know, teaching about native peoples. Um, and one of the things I try to do, the very first thing I try to do whenever I work with any institution um, is try to reset the time clock of uh, human occupation of this land back to 12,000 plus years. Uh, that's an important thing for, to happen because even professors of today uh, have been taught through the school system that, you know, essentially time began when uh, colonization began uh, or, you know, with uh, with contact by Europeans. And uh, that's, a, a you know, an implicit bias that they end up having to work themselves through. Um, so my perspective on education is very much uh, counter to what is often taught in the public school system and, and, and um, working to, uh, with uh, uh, colleagues of mine, change that system to update itself to be more reflective of uh, indigenous histories, which uh, have a much deeper, uh, uh, you know, sense of uh, um, to this land, especially. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the uh, the what I what I call uh, the essential owners manual for this land is actually located within the languages of the native peoples who occupied this land. Uh, we see the wildfires going on uh, in the West right now as a result of climate change and other things. But um, you know, historic 
historically, if you look through the archaeological evidence, wildfires of that humongous, uh, uh, you know, uh, of destruction uh, were not happening uh, due to the forest management procedures used by Native peoples. And even in the Northeast here, uh, we're seeing uh, the, um, uh, the National Forest Service start to take on indigenous um, methods methodologies for managing forests, which would mean uh, burning out underbrush, getting rid of the fuel that would fuel a large forest fire, uh, and in fact, uh, make the land more fruitful for the things that we would hunt and gather for. So uh, what we're seeing these days is science is actually what I, from my perspective, is catching up um, to what my people have known for thousands of years. Um, so this is a picture of myself from a TEDx talk I did back in 2013. Um, and and uh, I wasn't doing a lot of public speaking before this time. Uh, this is really one of my first, uh, you know, it wasn't a job. It was you do TEDx talks for free. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, this is one of my first times uh, telling my story uh, to the public. Uh, it's available on YouTube if you ever want to look back at it. It's, uh, you know, seven, it's uh, seven years old now. And I was uh, definitely a little nervous. So I'm uh, not quite the polished speaker that I am today. Um, but it does have a good message about how I, you know, got through this life, uh, you know, and uh, what I always tell people is that it took me 18 years to grow up to become a good Passamaquoddy man. It took me another 18 years to figure out how to live as, as an American uh, once I left the reservation. And um, a lot of what kept me going through all of it was music. Uh, music has been the thing that has tied me down and kept me going through a lot of it. So uh, when I talk about education, uh, music is usually part of uh, the, the process. Uh, although I won't be singing for you today, unfortunately, it doesn't come out as good online. Uh, so <laughs> um, I won't be doing any of that for you today, unfortunately. Um, but it talks about you know the, the way it was handed down to me. And my education career was really handed down to me by my father, Wayne Newell, you can kind of see in that background picture there that's uh, who I was talking about at the moment. Um, my father uh, grew up in Zibayeg, which is our other uh, Passamaquoddy reservation on the U.S. side, uh, now called Pleasant Point. Um, and uh, he grew up speaking Passamaquoddy first in, in houses that didn't have electricity, didn't have running water. Uh, he grew up in a time when our tribes were considered wards of the state. So literally, we had a paternalistic relationship where the state had complete control over our territories, over our life ways. Uh, we had 80% unemployment on the reservations. Uh, many people still live by subsistence, which meant hunting, fishing, and other things, and also selling baskets. That was the one way we engaged with the market economy. Um, and he didn't learn English until he was 10 plus years old, uh, but eventually got himself a master's degree in 1971 from Harvard University, a graduate degree in education. Uh, and uh, um, from there has a kind of a, a, a monumental career uh, in education working, um, you know, first off to uh, find ways to uh, change our language to a written language so that we could, uh, you know, find ways to teach it in this modern day world. Uh, and also the creation of our tribal dictionary. Uh, and David Francis is largely responsible for a lot of that work, but my father was the engine behind it for 40 plus years, and we now have a 20,000 entry uh, dictionary uh, that's available. Um, you know, so uh, he's also preserved a lot of our music, and so I grew up watching him do exactly what you see me doing on the stage right here. <laughs> um, you know, watching him, uh, you know, talk about our language, our history, our culture, um, and using music to do so. You know, so that's kind of where I got it from. And I, I kind of tell people that I'm second generation when it comes to this. Um, you know, I, I'm sitting these days as the head of Maine's only Smithsonian Affiliate Museum, and I only have a bachelor's degree. Uh, and that's because my board of trustees recognizes my life experience doing this type of work and also the fact that I'm multi-generational uh, when it comes to it. Um, this is my father right here. This is me at, I think, eight years old. I can't remember exactly for sure. Um, on the Passamaquoddy Reservation in Madoc Uh And my father, for a short time after our federal recognition, after our land claim settlement, was um, our tribal representative. And for, for those that don't know, Maine is the only state that has tribal representatives in the state legislature. Um, now, uh, it, it sounds nice, but um, uh, they are non-voting members. Uh, so they are 
are present uh, and they are allowed to co-sponsor, um, not sponsor solely on their own, but to co-sponsor legislation with other legislators, but do not have the rights to vote. However, um, this is something that goes back to the 1800s. It has been an on and off uh, relationship where sometimes the tribes have pulled, um, you know, uh, the representatives out of the state government. And that's currently what's happened with the Penobscot Nation. Uh, they have pulled their representative out of the state government. Um, but the first two seats at the time, it was only Passamaquoddy's and Penobscot's represented. Uh, now they include the Maliseets and the Mi'kmaqs that are in the state as well. Uh, the first two seats were reserved for the Passamaquoddy's and Penobscot tribes. Uh, my father served a four-year term as our tribal representative to the state legislature. And one of the coolest things that I thought back at that time was that you got this blue license plate with the number one on it because of, we were the first seat. Uh, I was extremely proud of this, you know, as a kid, uh, you know, just riding around in our old you know uh, grocery wagon there um, uh, you know with these plates on and uh, we got to go into uh, all the uh, the fairs in within the state for free as well that was one of the perks of <laughs> uh, that my father had for uh, you know for the work that he was doing but I was extremely proud of it you know and uh, I knew that he was doing great things uh, and it, to me what he was doing was just normal uh, to what other people was you know at times amazing and and, uh, you know, I, I find myself, you know, ironically uh, doing the same type of work uh, where uh, to me, what I consider normal uh, to others is sometimes enlightening. Um, but it's it's because of uh, the work of the humanities in the work of the humanities, you can change someone's direction within a moment. Um, you know, Mary talked about, uh, you know, the tour that I gave at the Pequot Museum. I loved using that space to be able to tell Pequot history uh, because it can change a person's direction about Connecticut's history within that hour's time that I spend with you uh, going through those exhibits. And that's one of the reasons why I work in the humanities is because of the power that we have to do so. Not to say that the STEM, uh, you know, I was actually a STEM kid for a long time. I was an engineering major when I entered Dartmouth. Um, you know, so not to say STEM is not important, uh, but it is a methodolog method uh, me sorry, uh, a methodical approach, sorry, that is the word, a methodical approach, you know, that takes time to learn and build and things of that. And in the humanities, sometimes you can navigate yourself, um, you know, to the things that, that attract you the most and where you have passion. And for me, it turns out it is education and educating the world about Passamaquoddy's and other native peoples. Um, a little bit of the history of Wabanaki peoples. Uh, Wabanaki peoples are uh, located in this, you know, general area here, um, and are, uh, at one time we're over 24 tribes. Now we are five tribes that are left, which are the, the Abenaki tribes located uh, in Quebec. Vermont and New Hampshire, uh, the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Micmac, and Maliseet. Most of the Mic and that's north of our neighbors, the Wampanoag people. Uh, the anniversary of the Plymouth Landing, uh, and of course, uh, the Plymouth Landing was not the first time that Europeans arrive uh, in, uh, you know, what we call the Americas. In fact, um, the territory down south in Connecticut, the Long Island Sound area, um, in 1524, when Giovanni de Verrazano came through that territory, by canoes, uh, they, they showed the ship how to get through the shoal. He spent time among them. He went as far as 15 leagues inland and wrote his observations of these manicured forests, um, just beautiful looking like parks, uh, things of that sort. But when you look at them, sometimes the, the, a lot of maps will skip the whole fact that he landed in Maine as well after that because he wasn't allowed to actually come on shore. Um, there was a very different reception when he came upon the Wabanaki peoples. Uh, in fact, uh, in 1524, uh, he was met by many canoes, buttocks, and, and slapped their buttocks uh, in, in, a, in a, a, a not-so-friendly gesture. 
year. Um, trade uh, with the tribes, the Wabanaki tribes, by the mode of a small boat driven you know, uh, uh, um, uh, driven up to a rock and a rope being, bring them back up. And so what that shows is that by 1524, our peoples, the Wabanaki peoples, were already well acquainted with European ships and what European ships could bring, which included disease, which included slave traders at times, but also included the trade items, the metal items that we sought, um, you know, which were improvements on the technologies that we had. Um, you know, so the trade was allowed, but contact and landing was not allowed. Uh, and this was not just, uh, you know, Verrazano, this is, you know, Port Portuguese, uh, the Dutch, uh, the English, the French were all coming to the territory way back then, uh, as, as early as even the 15th century, even the time of Columbus, um, they were coming to the territory as a secret fishing spot because the, the codfish were, were such high quality and were so thick in the waters around Atlantic, what we now call Atlantic Canada, um, that it was said at certain times of the year that you could walk across the bays on the backs of them. There were so many fish in the water. Uh, so this was their secret fishing spot. They just weren't writing uh, about their exploits because they didn't want anybody else knowing where they were getting all of their haul from. Um, it wasn't until Verrazano came through that we get a finally uh, a written account. Um, so I come at this from a very different perspective, you know, that, you know, 1620 in the Mayflower landing where there's people celebrating that uh, 400th year anniversary, it was really not that big of a deal. Uh, and um, uh, there was a whole lot of action that happened before that. And I like to enlighten people about that, that even when the English landed in 1620, the only reason they were allowed to stay was because the Wampanoags had been devastated by a, an epidemic called the Great Dying that started in Maine and made its way down the coastal shore through their territory and wiped out um, the entire, almost the entire village of Patuxet, which is now Plymouth, Massachusetts. So uh, because that village was wiped out, it gave a landing spot for um, the Mayflower to land. And um, the Wampanoags allowed them to stay because they were under threat of uh, the Narragansetts who were not affected by the epidemic. The epidemic stopped uh, before it came through their territory and uh, the Wampanoag territory was under threat. Therefore, they needed an ally who had guns. And the Wampanoags were well aware that the English did have guns at the time and they could use that alliance to preserve their territory. Uh, and in fact, when the Wampanoags first approached um, the people in uh, what was becoming Plymouth Plantation, Samoset greeted them in English because he had been working with English traders in the state of Maine uh, for years prior to that. So uh, oh, I wish this picture was better. I don't know why I got so strung off to the side. Let me go back for a second. Um, this is a picture from the Abbey Museum. And uh, what it does here is it re-describes the territory we were just looking at without the colonial borders um, and with native place names of the rivers and things of that sort. Now, even 300 years ago, uh, 300, sorry, 100 years ago in 1920, uh, the 300th anniversary of the Plymouth Landing was being celebrated in what is Plymouth, Massachusetts down in this territory right here. And uh, what they did was they invited Pasquaquati and Panasca chiefs and their families to come down as part of that celebration and they did but they didn't come down by car uh, they came by canoe they literally traveled by canoe and if you're wondering how you navigate this landscape by you know the waterways it's much easier to look at it if you take out the colonial borders and observe the landscape the way our ancestors have observed it for 12,000 years you can see how they came all the way from Skudig and Bonawapske Gig uh, down through this territory, you know, either by coastal waterways that were well known or occasionally using rivers and portages that were well known. Uh, and, you know, we were making these journeys all the way from Gaspeg, way up here by the northern part of what is now the Gaspe Peninsula, uh, the St. Lawrence River. We could make journeys all the way down to uh, the wampum producing tribes, which are around Long Island Sound and, uh, and uh, Cape Cod here. Wampum, uh, of course, produced 
you know, out of Quahog, uh, you know, the, the purple and white beads that are used by Iroquois tribes were also used by Wabanaki tribes as ways to make treaties, as ways to preserve our histories and ways to preserve protocols amongst the Confederacy members of the Wabanaki Confederacy. And we could not produce those without, uh, you know, the shells that were only found in the Long Island Sound and the Cape Cod area. So we were definitely mobile all over the territory and uh, we were keeping memories, mapping the territory with songs. Uh, that was one of the, and if you think about it, you know, oral history works great telling stories, but the stories can change from whole, from time to time. But all of us learned alphabetical order by learning the ABC song. So when it comes to memory, you remember things almost exactly if you learn it in a song versus learning it in a story. And uh, it wasn't until the French Catholics came through and kind of, you know, discouraged uh, and destroyed the tradition uh, that that tradition ended. But many of the communities would keep it alive. And so they traditionally knew how to get from one place to another using old portages or riverways uh, based off the songs that they knew you know, back in 1920, just 100 years ago. Um, now, I talked, uh, uh, I mean, you heard in the um, uh, introduction, I worked on a film called Dawnland, and uh, I was a senior advisor to that. Now, what is a senior advisor to a documentary? Well, um, you know, that's hard to explain because I was kind of uh, brought in in the, in the post-production. Uh, they had already done all the filming. Um, and uh, they were producing the film and they needed somebody to help guide. And uh, I was kind of like a, you know, utility infielder, you know, whatever position I, you know, I needed to fill to help the film, whether it was fundraising or including tribal, uh, you know, and getting uh, information culturally competent or other things of that sort, um, you know, that's what I did. And uh, this is one of my contributions to this story right here. When I saw the very first rough cut of the film, they were naming the community communities oftentimes back and forth either with the native name and then the, later on in the film the English name it was going back and forth it was not um, you know uh, consistent throughout the film and my suggestion to them was that's going to be completely confusing to your audience they're not going to understand what's going on even Mainers would probably have a hard time understanding what was going on uh, and my suggestion was not to you know instead of using the English names which would have been easier for anybody especially Mainers to identify what we were talking about that we use uh, the traditional uh, tribal names of all of the communities that are, are in existence today. And uh, in, in that way, somebody watching the film, you, even a person from the state of Maine would be able to recognize where these places are because they're already familiar enough with the state of Maine, would recognize you know, uh, what we're talking about and uh, end up having to learn a little bit of our language, much like Mary did at the very beginning there. And, you know, and I'm, I you know, give it up to her bravery for for, for attempting uh, you know, our language uh, because, and that's the whole point you know is that uh, you know if you're going to learn about the history of this landscape period that means you need to not learn it within uh, the, the confines of a foreign language which is the English language you need to learn it within our languages and so what I'm trying to do here my suggest with my suggestion is normalize the use of traditional uh, native place names um, for people that are watching the film. And so this is a layer of education that was, you know, uh, kind of subtly entered into the film. Uh, and every time they go to one of the communities, they use the names uh, that you see on the map here. Now, they did include the colonial landscape, which means that you can see the difference between Maine and Canada. That's just, you know, um, uh, that was something that, uh, you know, uh, I, I wasn't too hot on, but was important to have in there so that, you know, people would have a reference because this is how uh, Americans and Canadians do see this landscape nowadays. And so it's subtle. Um, it's just a very slight color change, you know, so they, they did take into account my, uh, my slight objection to it. Uh, and they made uh, the colonial borders rather subtle. Uh, and even the names of the towns that you see listed on there are in light gray, you know, so the, they're not the primary thing that you that you focus on. Um, my work with Mystic River Singers, um, you know, a lot of education, it, it's, you know, even though we were making music, we were traveling to Palos, a lot of what we do is educational, and especially we, when we get invited into spaces such as filmmaking. Um, so some of the stuff that we've done, uh, we worked in a film called Naturally Native, which came out in the 90s. Um, the picture on the left is actually us filming a scene for a film that actually never got uh, fully produced, sadly. It was supposed to be called Concrete 49, uh, but we were filming a scene in time 
Times Square, um, which is an interesting place to try to film, uh, uh, you know, uh, a live scene in the summertime uh, when all of the tourists are surrounding you in droves as soon as you start to uh, sing. Uh, you know, so that was a, a heck of an experience. You know, we, we, we drew such a large crowd that the police asked us to move along um, <laughs> because uh, and, and people started to jump into the shots. Uh, so there was all kinds of crazy things going on. Um, but, you know, a lot of times what happens, what we're doing is we're, we're we are all, uh, you know, brought into this with traditional protocols. You know, all the gentlemen you see there uh, are brought into this and we're trying to make good examples of how the, the music should be presented properly. Um, you know, rather than the way Hollywood has traditionally done it through non-native um, uh, composers uh, ever since the 1890s. Um, which is still something where we're, we're uniquely familiar with. If I were able, if I were to uh, ask you to describe the sound of Native America, um, you would, you know, probably think of the melancholy uh, minor key mel melodies that were created by uh, composition uh, by composers, you know, all the way even up to the 1990s. Um, minor key melodies, if for those that don't uh, know about uh, how music is created, are ways, you know, uh, major key melodies are the happy, uplifting music that we hear. Pop music is typically major key melodies. Minor melody, minor key melodies are the sad, um, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's the opposite of that and uh, can be aggressive as well. And uh, if you watch old Westerns, Native people are always introduced with a minor key melody. So this is, you know, so, uh, once again, feeds an implicit bias of savagery and warlike people uh, and it forgets the, about the science uh, that we created uh, you know and all of the history that we were preserving and the ways that we preserved it and things of that sort um, the picture on the right is uh, an, um, actually a, a, an art film uh, film opera it's five and a half hour film called River of Fundament and uh, uh, we are once again uh, working with an American composer Jonathan Bepler um, the, he wanted uh, you know a particular uh, song style style of song he, he uh, you know he kind of uh, recruited us for this film because uh, we were the round dance songs that we sing which is something that you know came from the Cree people the style that we sing um, nowadays uses English lyrics and one of the hallmarks of Mystic River when we sing round dance if if we use English lyrics people can understand them you know a lot of times Paul singers you, you can hear the words but you don't understand them all some sometimes but usually when we sing them we were pretty good at uh being able to sing them so everybody could understand everything we were singing and and the words that we were given were very complex they go very much into egyptian mythology and things of that sort which are buried in the film uh you know and it was a complex thing to do and so one of our singers the guy with uh, uh the medallion the bear medallion you see in the center there uh the red shirt um created was given the words and created the song so the composition is ours uh and in this film this film opera you know we represented the music uh, to fit into their framework by creating it ourselves um, you know so uh, it's a little bit different you know uh, you get a more authentic feel to the music uh, and it's a very powerful scene we actually serve as Egyptian gods which sounds strange I it would take me an hour to tell to tell you the whole story behind this film so um, but what else do we do? Uh, the Pequot Museum, as I said, I love working there. You can see me doing what I love right here. This is in the Pequot Museum, uh, doing uh, some work with the Upstander Academy, um, which works on um, uh, is a, a six-day summer institute on genocide education, uh, and is how I got involved with Dawnland. Um, the creators of the film Upstander Project are also the creators of the Upstander Academy, and what we do is we train teachers over six days on how to teach about genocide and we focus uh, a large part of it on indigenous genocide. Uh, and the Pequot War is the first war of aggression against Native peoples where Europeans win. Uh, and it was an attempt at a, at a total genocide. It was not successful, but it was nearly successful in totality. Um, and uh, the, you know, the effects of it were still felt and the genocide continued for hundreds of years after. And so when I tell the story of the Pequots, that's my wife and my children's history that I'm telling there. I was very passionate. I still am very passionate about that, getting that history across. Um, that, you know, the creation of the Connecticut colony first relied upon the genocide of Native peoples, a pattern that was created in the Connecticut colony and then was taken up by the U.S. government and repeated over and over and over as the country would expand westward.
Um, the, at the Pequot Museum, uh, once again, we, we do things a little differently. So Thanksgiving is, uh, once again, the narrative about Thanksgiving was created in the, in the 19th century by fiction writers. We've mythologized that story of the 1620 uh, Plymouth Landing. They did have a feast in 1621, um, you know, as they took in their crops uh, between Ostomequin's people, the Wampanoag, uh, and uh, Bradford's people, the English. Uh, but it, it was so uh, unremarkable to the East even the English that uh, they only wrote one paragraph about it in, in their in their account, uh, but we mythologized it to the point where it's now a holiday and you know the story of pilgrims and Indians getting along and it's all great and colonization is awesome. Um, what we do here at the Pequot or here at the Pequot Museum, this is a yearly uh, uh, program we've been putting on called Feast. And, uh, you know, instead of Thanksgiving, what I would do is typically give some histor history on how the Thanksgiving holiday got created or what native Thanksgivings are, which is more resemblant of the actual Thanksgiving holiday that we, we observe these days. Um, you see me with my drum there. I would often uh, sing for the food uh, and all of the menu was all indigenous inspired. We had Chef Sherry Pockton on the staff at the time. Uh, she created the menu. So there was no, uh, um, you know, milk or butter on in any of the ingredients because those still, still come until cows come with Europeans. Uh, we were serving duck, we were serving uh, fish, uh, um, striped bass, uh, you name it, squash, corn, beans, uh, you know, so it was a very much uh, a well attended event and has grown to become something uh, where we get about 250 uh, people a year paying 75 bucks a piece to come and sit down uh, and enjoy this meal of all indigenous inspired food and learning a little bit of history from a different perspective. Uh, I am not there now I, I, and the museum is currently closed this year so we won't be seeing that event this year but I'm hoping that uh, it does it does continue uh, next year. Um, so what else do we do in this world here to combat uh, the way the public school system has been missing? Uh, the Agamal Educational Initiative was born out of uh, three, uh, the three of us that worked at the people Museum. Uh, Dr. Jason Mancini, who uh, was the executive director uh, for several years and then is now uh, running Connecticut Humanities, and uh, my colleague and Donna Spears, uh, who worked uh, in multiple capacities at the Pequot Museum and in multiple museums, uh, we were all seeing the same thing. People were coming into the Pequot Museum and they were literally the adults and the children, not just the children, it was, you know, the, the adults and sometimes the teachers were asking questions uh, with a Pequot educator in front of them, they would ask if the Pequot tribe still existed. Um, they were just not making the connection, you know, and so this was a, a, an occurrence that was common enough to let us know that regionally within the area, um, there is such a lack of Native representation in the way Native histories are taught in social studies and history that something had to be done. We had to take what was being taught in the museum outside the museum walls somehow and to start to incorporate it as a normative within the way we teach history and social studies within the region here. And that's what Agamal Ed Educational Initiative is all about. Me and my two colleagues, uh, Agamalt translates to the snowshoe path, which is the picture of the, of the snowshoe path that you see there. It's a symbol resemblant of what we're trying to do. Um, the snowshoe path, traditionally amongst my people, you know, they would make their way out into the woods away from the village over long distances to find firewood and other things. Uh, and uh, as they got their work done, they would make their way back to Agamalt, back to the snowshoe path to return home. And so what it is, is we're creating these new learning paths and the, the thing about using the, the snowshoe path is the more people that use it, the easier it becomes to traverse. Um, so by creating these new learning paths, we hope that others will follow and uh, the path of talking about Native content becomes easier and easier uh, and it starts to become more and more common for people to use it. So these are my colleagues here uh, and Donna Spears and Dr. Jason Mancini. Uh, Jason's still located in Connecticut and Donna lives in Rhode Island. Her husband, uh, a tribal councilman for uh, the Narragansett tribe. Um, and there's a little bit of what we do, furthering knowledge of Native Native America through innovative learning approaches designed to impact how we engage history and contemporary realities. And that's big contemporary realities because the colonial museum model oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, shows uh, Native uh, peoples existing as only in the past. And that's why when they come into the tribal museum, um, they would ask the questions that they would do is because they had 
had been, you know, uh, fed him biases implicitly, not necessarily ones they were aware of, um, that all the Native people in Connecticut were gone. Uh, and that's what they were walking into. Uh, but as I said, the, uh, what I loved about that museum is that within that hour's time, they would leave there uh, more excited than they came in because they were enlightened to the actual existence, uh, persistence of Native peoples and the histories uh, that they were not taught you know, yet uh, within their public school education. Uh, one of the things that Agamot does is we work with a collaborative approach anywhere where education happens. So Connecticut College is one of our partners in this work. Uh, we were contracted even with them through uh, last year. Um, you know, and, but what we try to do is build equity through collaboration. So what when we collaborate, um, we didn't want to become the experts on Pequot history. I'm not Pequot. Um, Indonis is not Pequot, you know, but Con Connecticut College resides on, on Pequot Mohegan uh, landscape. And so therefore, there needs to be a connection made uh, with Khan College and the local Native communities. And some of that was already happening prior to our coming in. But one of the things that we try to do as Agamal is build those bridges. Uh, and when we do so, we try to make sure that it has, is an equitable relationship because the history of anthropology and archaeology has been one of extraction, extracting knowledge and indigenous knowledge, interpreting it, and then, you know, people make careers out of it and none of it goes back into the communities even museums not giving uh, proper um you know uh um uh, some, uh, uh, so, uh proper um sorry, incorporation of, of Native people with access. There we go. That's, I'm not giving them proper access to the collections that they have within their museums. Um, so equity has to be built in, in, into it. And, uh, you know, in, in the modern day world, you know, part of that is money. I mean, we all these days are part of the market economy. So if you bring an Indigenous knowledge keeper into your, uh, you know, your institution, uh, they have a lifetime of knowledge within them. You should be paying them the same you would pay in PhD. Um, it is just sim that simple. Uh, you know, the, they don't give PhDs in our culture. Um, but if you bringing in somebody that is acknowledged uh, by their own community as somebody that has a lifetime of knowledge about a certain subject, you should be paying them equitably when you bring them into your institution. So when you or when you collaborate on future projects. And Con College to uh, Con College's credit has been doing a whole lot of work in this area, land acknowledgements, uh, the creation of Indigenous Peoples Day on campus, banners that we've worked with uh, that incorporate all tribal symbols from the Eastern Pequots, the state recognized Pequots, the, uh, the Mashantucket Pequots, the federally recognized ones, and the Mohegan tribe, uh, giving a, a lot of visibility on campus now um, to the fact that uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, occupying Indigenous territory. And uh, it's, it's, it's been quite a uh, um, an awesome thing to see, uh, you know, the community start to uh, really uh, take this on uh, amongst themselves. So this is, you know, these kind of talks that we're seeing here are all part and parcel to all of that work. Uh, we do work a lot of times with museums as well, uh, you know, a lot of colonial museums. This is actually a great exhibit that was at the Yale Art Gallery not too long ago uh, that was curated by Native uh, curators, students. Um, and what we're doing here, and typically when we go to a colonial museum and, and we're invited to do these talks were usually really critical of the way that they present Native art uh, because they're presented Native art, you know, only from the past or, you know, uh, context is missing, um, information is missing oftentimes. But this one, this particular one here, we're actually glorifying quite a bit because their approach was so much different. So rather than, you know, saying uh, if, they, if the artist was uh, not known for a piece that they had, rather than saying artist not unknown, uh, they would say artist once known. Uh, to make, you know, make sure that we give a living spirit to uh, these items that are, you know, included in the collection of these museums. Um, there's Indonis, you know, doing her thing right there as well. Uh, this is uh, actually at the MFA Boston. Uh, this was uh, an experimental kind of uh, uh, exhibit they had going on here where you see there's no glass case uh, around this dress. So you get to see the dress not laid flat, uh, you know, or, or something of that sort. You see it on a mannequin and you can get a good 360 view of it. And there's not a piece of glass, you know, blocking you that sense of access that you can, you know, kind of breathe in the sense of it uh, is not blocked from you. And, uh, you know, this is some of the things that we work with museums on is uh, updating the way they present Native content to bring back as much as possible context, uh, which gets, you know, uh, disturbed 
moved by the fact that you're presenting native content within a colonial context of a rectangular room uh, in glass cases and things of that sort when instead of uh, on the land which is where our cultures and our languages are born. Uh, we also do a lot of work in local area with putting on uh, different talks, uh, like the one we have here today. Um, and then uh, we worked last year with the MFA Boston on their very first Indigenous Peoples Day celebration, an event that drew over 5,500 people for, and that was an amazing amount for an inaugural event. Uh, that's me on the left performing with Lisa Ojig, two-time world champion uh, uh, hoop dance um, uh, uh, winner, uh, you know, doing her thing there. Uh, and this drew, uh, this performance right here, you know, started out with about 100 people uh, that came to the scheduled performance. By the end of it, we had five to 600 people. Uh, it went a rousing you know, round of applause. So just imagine the MFA Boston as kind of a, a rock star place. You know, it was, it was, it was basically rocking that day living native artists all over the place showing off their their arts. Um, we also have done some work with the Norman B. Leventhal Map Center on uh, this exhibit called America Transformed, mapping the 19th century. Um, the Leventhal Map Center worked on this for three years, but they knew that they were telling a very one-sided history. And Agamalt was not born when this when they began curating this, but when we were brought into it, what we did was we worked with them uh, all, uh, you know, um, of their captioning. Uh, we're talking 140 pages of material that we went through and we updated the language. They were doing things like a museum wouldn't typically do when talking about uh, westward expansion. A hundred years, the country expanded from, you know, just east of the Mississippi to all the way to the west coast. And um, they were writing things like the gradual expansion in the captions. And we were crossing that out, you know, because if your time frame is, you know, the beginning of colonization, then a hundred years might seem like a long gradual expansion. But if your timeline began 12,000 plus years ago than 100 years is the snap of your fingers. So we were replacing those words with rapid. And what we also brought in was we brought native educators uh, from multiple disciplines, uh, uh, scholars, I should say, from multiple disciplines to come in and react to the finished um, uh, captioning that we had, you know, updated for them uh, and the information and the maps and give their own perspective perspective, 100 words unedited, uh, the museum was not allowed to edit their words. So occasionally you would run into viewpoints that were sometimes at odds with the information being presented. But it was such a transformative uh, way for people to see the American westward expansion. Uh, and this is the idea behind it. The perspective of native populations in the 19th century cannot be properly told in mass because native concepts about land are not two dimensional. And qualifying ownership with a paper document was an imported European concept during the rapid expansion of the United States, the idea of native homeland, a multi-layered place giving life, sustenance, language, spiritual communion, and kinship would change to a theory that land is preordained to be, quote unquote, improved or developed. Uh, these words we still use today every time we build on the land and destroy it. Uh, we, we used to use improved, now we say developed uh, for the purpose of commodification. So when we develop land is to make money. Uh, that's why we do it. Um, this was a near universal change from native land management systems that has sustained populations for millennia. And you see these uh, inquiries that we developed for students to go through as they're thinking about these things. What stories have shaped our understanding of United States histories? Who are the storytellers? Because that's very important. Uh, and what are the stories that we still need to hear? Hence the, the native viewpoints that you see showing up uh, within. Uh, and then of course the work we did with uh, uh, Standing with Standing Rock, uh, we wrote about uh, some of the work that began at Kong College, the teaching that we had during uh, the Standing Rock movement back in 2016. Uh, and now I am uh, working with the Abbey Museum up in uh, Bar Harbor, Maine, um, which has uh, once again gone under a decolonization initi initiative through my predecessor and has now changed my job description from president CEO to executive director and senior partner to Wabanaki Nations, which signifies that in 
this colonial museum that I am now the head of will forever have a a, a, a one-to-one connection and will center the voices of Wabanaki peoples rather than extract from Wabanaki peoples and not give access to the collections that we have. We are going to be partnered with them and we're going to center their voices and use anthropology and archaeology as resources to uh, uh, to back up uh, the indigenous knowledge that we're passing onward uh, within the, the, the walls of the Abbey Museum. So that's where I'll stop right there. I think I went over a few minutes here, but I'll hang out for as long as people want to ask questions. Um, and I've stopped my screen sharing. So we are back to uh, Mary and, I, oh, is it Mary and I talking or? Who, who oh, I, I, I think I'm on, yeah, I, I'm still on. Laura's on. Does anyone have questions? I have, I have a question, Chris. Um, your language, your native language, do you get to use it often? Do you speak it with your children? Is it continuing? That's a great question. So uh, when it comes to our languages, uh, you know, I've been living in Connecticut for 20 plus years and, and because of the level of genocide, uh, you know, to the point where, um, you know, forced assimilation was in the 18th century, um, the, the Southern Algonquin tribes have been just working in the last 20 years to get to the point of having a, a spoken language again in the Southern Algonquin dialects. Um, and Passamaquoddy is an is the Northeastern Algonquin dialect, which is much different. Uh, there's some things that are similar just in the form, um, but it's it's a much different dialect. So while living in Connecticut, I've only had my kids uh, to be able to try to teach and talk as much as I can to. But um, now that I'm back up in, in Chquabnakig, uh, up in uh, the land of the dawn, um, you know, I'm beginning, you know, once again to use it uh, much more because uh, the, the, what we figured out was, uh, you know, our, our uh, the generation before mine was fluent. Uh, you know, they grew up speaking it fluently and learned English second. My generation is the first generation to grow up with electricity and running water in our house. The electricity meant we had English speaking media like radios and televisions. And so my generation grew up speaking English first as a result of that media being in our houses. And that's where we started to see the drop off in the use of fluent language happening with my generation. And so what's happened is those folks from my father's generation and before that started to recognize we needed to do something, you know, the formation of a written language was part of that. But now what we're doing is we're taking the kindergarten kids, we're putting them into full immersion schools where they speak Basmaquati with Passamaquoddy teachers all day. Um, that's really the only way we can do it, right, is we got to bring them up speaking it and it has to be normal for them to do so. And, and that's an important thing because our language is so different. We do not have the concept of ownership of land as property uh, within the concept of within uh, the, the framework of Passamaquoddy. Um, and I always talk about the differences, you know, in, in the English language, we're all in speaking English now. So we're speaking in the blueprint of the, of the land of England. And in England, you can own land as property. People did that. Uh, you had title to it, you know, piece of paper gave you title, whatever. It got handed down through generations. Um, and you could even own people as property, right? Slavery existed. Um, but in our language, uh, what would be considered uh, property is the land or the dirt. Dukguan, that's our word for it. Uh, you know, we would uh, really translate, it has a deeper meaning than just dirt or land. It really translates as the molecules of our ancestors. So it shows that we understand the scientific life cycle of everything, uh, that we all become part of the soil again. Uh, but it also shows that we have a spiritual connection. We realize that the soil is literally, uh, you know, molecules, pieces of our ancestors. Therefore, we cannot own individual plots uh, as property for ourselves. Since Instead, we caretake it uh, so that it can produce for all of the life that exists around us, um, which was very, very different. And so that's why, you know, the framework of how we see the world, the worldview uh, can all, you know, only properly be known if we understand our language. And I'm so thankful that I grew up in a bilingual house hold, where even though I'm not a fluent speaker currently, uh, because of 20 years of living in Connecticut, I still understand, can read and write. I have all of the tools that I need to have that worldview, that Passamaquoddy worldview, and understand the world through those lens of, the, of my ancestors. And that's a gift that I want to make sure gets passed on to my children so that they have that worldview as well. Great question. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, just a comment first, that was a great question, and I would recommend everyone to read Braiding Sweetgrass by um, Kimmerer, 
new book, it, uh, it goes into what you were just saying about language and meaning. Uh, boy, it's a life-changing book. I'm not done with it yet. Braiding Sweetgrass. My question to you, uh, while you were speaking um, about the music, um, you described the bum 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 that you hear in the cowboy movies. The native flutes that are sold at the museum gift shop and other places. I got my first flute um, while well, I used to live in Arizona. These are uh, made in uh, yeah, Navajo makers, um, big company, beautiful flutes. When I bring flutes to, to play, usually for seniors, um, that's the first thing they hear is that minor scale. And oh yeah, that's what we hear in the, in the, in the movies. Um, so what you said really, really stood out for me. It was, um, I guess the question is, why do those flutes have that scale? And um, what does your music sound like? So when it comes to flute, um, you know, flutes and drums are universal to the world. You know, everybody's created um, some sort of flute um, in every culture and some sort of drum in every culture. Um, now, when it comes to scales within native cultures, they can vary tremendously uh, from not just tribe to tribe to tribe, but from person to person within the tribe. Um, so if you read some of the old ethnographers, you know, they have a lot of bias in the, in the way they write about things, but they would write about scale like within uh, Ojibwe singers. Uh, and they, uh, I can remember one of them, uh, an account where, where uh, two Ojibwe chiefs were kind of having like a sing off, you know, like they, they were going all, they were handing their drum and their rattle back and forth all night long. And they were each singing songs and they were they were basically entertaining, um, you know, their crowds, uh, you know, people from both villages all night long, and they were trying to find a winner. They were having a contest, um, you know, so, <laughs> but the scale between the two singers, because the, the ethnographer had a, a written account of this uh, from somebody, was different, uh, even though they were singing songs, you know, from the same, uh, uh, you know, a library of music. Um, so when it comes to flutes, it literally, you know, it can depend upon where you get your flute made uh, and, uh, you know, and which tribe you're talking about, whether they prefer, because what is dissonant to the American Western music ear uh, is consonant sometimes within a, a cultural context to a native ear. And that's one of the reasons why the, the transcriptions that you see from 1900 they cannot capture the microtones of the pentatonic scales that are often being used uh, by native singers, which are just not included within the Western diatonic scale. Um, so that's one of the reasons why, so, you know, it, the, it really depends on the flute maker uh, when it comes to that. But a lot of times in, in, in flute traditions are so different. Some, for some tribes like the Cheyenne, you have to actually earn your way into the society to be able to play those flutes because of the this very spiritual you know and ceremonial use the way they use it whereas in my territory we were taught that we were given the voice of the eagle into the cedar trees so that we could make beautiful things right you know so if you if you hear david santapas who is a micmac uh, flute player a lot of his songs a major key to it. They're actually very, very much more pleasant sounding. Um, whereas uh, with other tribes, they might not be. And that you might be because of their traditions, because of it, it, uh, music that evolved from what was once ceremonial to a now evolving outside of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. Just, Thank you. Thank you. We have any other questions? I, I have another music question. I, sure. I, I have a question. Oh. Um, can I jump in ahead of you, Marcy, real quick? And then, okay. Yes, Laura. Okay. Well, first of all, I feel like you've given us, in many ways, a crash course yeah. in understanding um, this time in our, in our history uh, and from 
um, implicit bias to language to the reading that we can do. Uh, so I, I, I have so many questions, but I'm just going to ask one. I'm really this documentary Dawnland that you've done um, about the Truth and Rec Reconciliation Commission and that process. I mean. Is it easy to, for us to find? And that sounds to me like a model of something that should be done in so many communities across the United States. And I really want to yeah. hear more about so, that. So when it comes to the TRC, what I always tell people is that Maine is just one state, right? And, and this story is, is, is you know, sp spread throughout the country. So like when I, when I talk to um, um, folks at screenings, what I often tell them is that we're just at the point where you buy the brand new textbook, right? The real hardcover and you hear that creak because it hasn't been opened yet. Yeah. That's where we're at when, to, when we're telling the story, right? And that we got a, a whole rest of the we need to go through that needs to understand this process so that we can begin you know heal, healing the multiple generations that have that have dealt with it um and uh, is the film available absolutely in fact uh con college can actually you know uh, go to dawnland.org you guys can uh, uh you know order it's as, as a teaching tool so it's really meant for places like universities and schools to take it and it has a teacher's guide that actually is free and downloadable that goes along with it which really delves into a lot of the colonial history you know the the, the good the bad and the ugly of colonial history and gives them a much more round is you know fifth bounce properly um, Phipps bounty proclamations, things of that sort being told uh, uh, all the way through uh, child removal, uh, in the Indian residential schools, things of that sort, um, you know, is all in the teacher's guide. So there's, and it's it's for multiple levels too. There's just something you can pull out of any of it. So if you go to dawnland.org, Connecticut College or Old Line Church um, can actually purchase the rights um, to have the, have the DVD and have screenings and then have talks about it, you know, and, and use it as an educational tool or just show it to your congregation members, you know, and just speak amongst yourselves, however way you want to do it, you can license it, you know, uh, for, for screenings that way for yourself. Great. Thank you. I have a question. Oh, wait, Marcy, you had one first, right? Go ahead, Mary. Um, uh, I was excited. Chris, with your answer to Marcy, because even though I only understood about one out of every 10 of those words, <laughs> um, I could see that Marcy was lighting up. <laughs> um, so I'm just curious about, you said that two of your children are, um, are online, some, to some level virtual learning. And I'm, I'm wondering from your opinion with that sort of change, um, do you see big opportunity because children are learning maybe a little bit more unique things from parents, aunties, family, extended family members while they're home if adults are able to be home with them, right? Yeah. So it's no, there, there's there's definitely a unique opportunity here. The one challenge that we have is that I currently live in Maine during the week and then I'm only coming, you know, from, from Saturday and then I leave Sunday again, um, you know, back up to Maine. So, uh, I, and sadly, I don't get to have that time with them, you know, to do what I would love to do with them during this, you know, time, uh, which would be, I would have passive body language classes, part of their, you know, <laughs> part of their daily routine. Um, but so I'm un unable to do that as, uh, as, as just because of the, the situation. If we were, if the pandemic didn't hit, we would all be living together in a house up in Maine right now. Um, but you know, uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, my uh, our oldest is a senior this year, and it was going to be hard enough for him to have to go to his senior year at a new high school. But imagine uh, as a senior, you know, having to do it under this. Um, yeah just couldn't do it to him. So we had the option of uh, keeping our house here in Connecticut for the time being for this year. Um, and uh, we, we chose to, you know, it's, it's not easy on any of us first to be a part all this time, but uh, that's the choice we made, uh, you know, for the good uh, for, of my son's sanity, you know, and my wife as well. So. Yeah. Um, well, more, more specifically, I'm curious um, about maybe your wider community, like are people coming together to take advantage of this time to teach something? It's almost like, uh, and I might just be fantasizing that this is the way I wish it went, um, but with the kids out of 
school somewhat that maybe you get to um, you, you get to teach there's an opportunity for them to learn something outside of the standard co colonized curriculum oh yeah there's tons of that coming up and I've been doing a lot of presentations the Abbey does a lot of presentations uh, about that type of work um, and this is not the first time uh, I've, you know I have one of these recorded uh, and there's probably a few of these on YouTube where I'm talking about these these types of topics or you know foundational mythology of the country um, native mascots uh, you name it you know there's the uh, um, I, I can't keep track uh, because I'm doing it virtually these days um, but what you know so there's a downfall of that and that we don't have that person to person interaction you, you know we're, we're missing all that but the upside is that uh, literally you 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 have the uh, potential of a worldwide audience um, so that very last slide I showed you was digital Abbey Indian Muse Abbey in Abbey Museum Indian Market which is our signature uh, market event which happens in in May and then the uh, digital Native American Festival which is a smaller market that we host in July uh, we converted those all to online and what what that did for the market was it exposed the level of the artist to people that lived way out of state some of them as far away as Ireland and the Pacific Islands uh, were watching and have watched because we left it all, all up on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page uh, the, uh, the entire events are all up there and, it, and what it became uh, on our side we, we, we have to worry about you know uh, our mission you know inspiring learning about the Wabanaki nations with every visit so um, what it was for us was we were bringing Bringing in these artists and they were able to present their art from a first person perspective right there's no interpretation whatsoever going on not the Abbey Museum not nobody these artists are talking about how they became artists what they do to create their materials everything from first person perspective so as educational material that is awesome uh, but on the other side their art is really awesome so it gives Great for you to see what they have and also we we host on our website and point to people uh, all the time uh, where you can go to profiles to contact the artists and buy from their stock if you want to have themselves and support the artists and some of these artists were getting orders from new collectors that were in different parts of the country that they would have never seen so that's the one upside to what's going on now is that with all of this virtual and the recording and everything of that sort is that there is more material that's available but it's not centralized yet and that that's uh, that's a project that I'm, I'm trying to figure out for the future nice. um uh, uh, Chris, I, I, I'm aware of the time and the fact that you are probably driving back to Maine uh, today. <laughs> um, wow. And uh, so, but just wonder if maybe we need to stop here. Um, well, Marcy, and... one more question. I'll, okay, I'll... Marcy, go for it. <laughs> oh, um, thank you so much for being with us today, Chris. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I went to the library at the uh, Pequot Museum uh, once upon a time. And I just want to say, I hope it opens up again. I was, oh, researching, I was researching music songs and the help that I got there was phenomenal. It was way beyond what I ha had imagined. Um, so I, I wish all the best for, uh, for all of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. The, the question was about Je uh, Joanne Shenandoah's recordings of women's songs. Mm -hmm. Those are Iroquois, yeah. Haudenosaunee songs. And to my ear, all the words sound the same. They're the same syllables in different arrangements. What's up? with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when it comes to um, Iroquois social songs, because you're not hearing the ceremonial songs, they would never allow that. Um, but they, they do record their social songs and Joanne Shenandoah takes advantage of that. And uh, oftentimes they, they, they come in, in their, their, whole, their whole sets of songs. Like they, 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 have, they have done such a good job keeping their music traditions alive that they have just in, individual singers have entire libraries. So for say Robin Dance, a singer can have a library of 12 songs in his head you right and they'll just sing and go through that and you know uh, uh, there might be other singers that are in there as well and they could keep robin dance going and then they would uh change to alligator dance that was, was to, that, that was one that came from the seminole tribe but there's multiple verses to it uh you know that are used by different people you know so um, and they're making uh, you know 
pole dance, of course, came about in the 90s. Yes. And that's a, a social dance. And new compositions are being made for these, these dances uh, uh, all the time. Fish dance, uh, you know, all of these social dance songs that they sing with each other. Um, women's shuffle dance, especially. So if you hear like women's shuffle dance, it follows the same pattern. Uh, you know, and uh, it always ends with that guy, how ya, hey ya, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally just the form of the song that the dancers are being cued into. Uh, this, you know, something's about to change, you know, or, or the, the end of the verse coming or something of that sort. Um, you, know, you notice uh, when I do, uh, I do a presentation on native music, one of the things I tell, you know, for Passamaquoddy music, we use a vocal command. We say Tahoe when the song is over. Uh, but other tribes uh, for like the Iroquois, it's the way they, they, they sing the end of the verse and will change the beat to a dun, dun, dun. Uh, and then powwow music will end on three or five beats, depending if it's northern or southern uh, plains music. And that's how you know the end of the song is coming. So it just really, what you're hearing is the form of the song uh right but they're creating a new composition within that form oh it's just so such a rich mm -hmm. such a rich array of of cultures mm -hmm. wow thank you um, thank you mm -hmm. well i wish we had five more hours to, to <laughs> spend with you chris maybe we could drive back to maine with you and just follow you around <laughs> there's so much to learn um so thank you again um for for giving us this this uh, taste of of uh, your beautiful culture and how we might learn more. I know personally, I um, have a lot to learn to become a better ally um, mm -hmm. and uh, come to terms with this woeful lack of of knowledge in my history. Um, and mm -hmm. so very grateful for, for what you've given us today mm -hmm. um, and look forward to having you back. Yeah, definitely. With mystic no. singers and so forth. Yeah. Right. No, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I love having these types of talks. Um, mm -hmm. It's always a good time. So uh, I appreciate you all. Yeah, and, and let me thank you, Chris, for your exuberant abundance of energy and mm -hmm. time and your generosity of your your wisdom and eloquence and speaking and your passion. I think we're all, I mean, I, when I went to the museum, I was inspired and I'm re-inspired. So thank you so, so much for giving us all of this great time. And I think we've all been challenged to, as, as Laura said, to learn a little bit more uh, in our own lives. So all thank right. you so much. Yeah, and when we open our doors again, hopefully by next summer, uh, you know, if you're in Mount Desert Island, it's a vacation area, by the way, in Maine. It's in Mount Desert yep. Island is where Acadia National Park is. Um, you know, so there's lots to do around there and not just the museum. But if you ever find a reason to come up to Bar Harbor, let me know. Uh, I'll be at the museum. I think okay. we'll do that. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Thank Bye. you. Good Thank luck. You. Safe Thanks travels. so much. Safe journey, Good night, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was really fun. Thank you, Chris.